Um, hi, everyone. Bonjour. Je m'appelle Stephanie. That is the extent of the French I know. So I heard that they're not really uh, having as many English speakers because it's the 10-year anniversary. So thank you for putting up with me today. I'm really excited to be here. I think this is the first in-person DevFest that I've presented at. So great to be in France out of all places. Um, as he said, I'm presenting on Sea to Sky, Building Resilient Applications on Google Cloud's Fiber Optic Network. So I'll be talking about the very fascinating terrestrial and subsea cable network and how that underpins not only Google Cloud, but also the public internet at large. So you might be wondering, why am I talking about this physical cable network when we're developers and with cloud applications? But as you might not know, you know, this is really what powers a lot of Google Cloud and how you're able to inherit the resilience that we've built into our physical cable network. So when you're building applications on Google Cloud, you are then giving your applications uh, a resilient life of their own. So today I am going to start by talking about how Google plans and designs its cable network and then talk about the virtualized software-defined network that sits on top that really is what underpins Google Cloud, and then finally talk about some of the managed services that exist on Google Cloud that you can leverage to inherit some of this high availability. Um, now, this is going to be somewhat of a product talk. It's going to focus mostly on Google and Google's infrastructure and products. And I won't be able to go ocean deep into every technical construct here. Um, but I do hope that you can walk away with some inspiration and some tips and tricks for your own applications here. You can kind of think of this talk like a layer cake that builds on top of each other. So just to give a quick intro, my name is Stephanie Wong. I am the head of developer engagement here at Google Cloud. So I focus on building online content that can help educate and inspire developers. Um, I'm also very passionate about women in technology, uh, participating in the community and academic world. And uh, a lot of what I do is talks. I also host the weekly Google Cloud Platform co podcast, if you've ever listened to that, where I interview a lot of our product managers, engineers, and other fellow DevRel folks. Um, and I've, I've won a few awards for some of the content and really enjoy what I do to educate developers and help them pass certifications, solve some of their toughest problems, um, and just inspire them. So a lot of what I cover is about all Google Cloud products, but recently I've been focused a lot on networking. Um, and you might be wondering why I like networking so much. So this all started back when I was studying information systems at UCLA. I was a student back then, and little did I know, actually, that UCLA was the birthplace of the internet. In 1969, a group of students ended up sending the very first message over the ARPANET to Stanford University. And fast forward 45 years, I would never expect me to stand in this very room with this mainframe that you see here. I was a research apprentice at the time, studying technology and its effect on society. And so I got to really be reminded constantly of the physical manifestations of uh, our software that surrounds us. And so I've always embraced that concept here. Fast forward another five years, I did something that I definitely didn't think I was ever going to be able to do, but I got the chance to visit a Google data center. Um, this was on top of me already having seen a data center in LA, but at Google, when I started working there, it's a very difficult thing to do, as you can imagine, because less than 1% of Googlers even get to enter a data center. I don't know if Abdel's here in the audience, but he used to work at a Google data center in Belgium, right? So he was one of the, the stars here <laughs> before anyone else could enter one. And so I was, of course, impressed by the physical scale of data centers, but I was more impressed once I started to learn more about the software stack that sits on top that enables our billion-plus user products like YouTube, Search, Gmail. Um, and this is all at the networking, compute, and storage layers. As I continued to study data centers, I also was interested in how data centers were connected to one another, how packets moved from one place in the world to another at global scale. And so one of the things that wowed me was this idea of subsea cables. I, I assume that many of you probably don't know that the very first subsea cable was deployed in 1858 to connect Europe to North America. But the message took 17 hours to deliver. <laughs> 
and that was at a rate of two minutes and five seconds per letter by Morse code. So you can imagine how long it would take to send an email, upload a TikTok video, and there would be no concept of live tweeting, and you would unfortunately have to get your news from the actual news, which nobody does today, right? So to many of your surprise, the cloud doesn't exist in the sky. It really exists underground, under sea, and in, uh, over our heads sometimes, too, in the cable. So close to the cloud, but not exactly the sky. So when you compare that capacity to today, now we're able to have cables that enable 340 terabits per second capacity. Now, just to give you a point of reference, that's about 25 million times faster than the global home internet connection. It might seem a little slow on this slide, but you're t I'm taking into account the global average. And that's about running, let's say, a 4K five-minute video 4.5 million times simultaneously. So it's extremely impressive stuff that's happening. Um, this, this is uh, you know, some of Google's metrics here. So clearly, we have really continued to push the need to increase our resilience and reliability of the internet as we've had this world of increasing uh, ballooning network demand. And so I've had a chance to dig into some of how we plan for capacity, and I've done over 25 hours of research, uh, interviewing different network engineers, diving into our own uh, design docs, and trying to find out a little bit more about how this all works. So since I've done that, I've really only been able to scratch the surface of the sea of information. So let's go ahead and dive into it. Nobody got that joke, but I, I got more coming. So hopefully I'll get a chuckle. All right, so first let's do some sub trivia, because why not? So raise your hand if you think the answer is true, and then raise your hand if you think the answer is false. So cable installation is slow, tedious, and expensive work. True? OK, false. OK, I think that answer was pretty obvious, but the answer is true. Cable installation, um, you know, it takes a lot of work, and we have to lay it on very flat surfaces of the ocean, avoiding ecological habitats, coral reefs, fishing beds, and so invariably, it can cost hundreds of millions of dollars. So definitely something that takes a lot of planning. All right, sharks are trying to eat the internet. True? OK, how about false? Oh, more people said false. I'm going to say false, because there was a video floating around 10 years ago that showed that happening, but that was like one time. And it's really rare that that happens. What's more common is fishing vessels dragging anchors. And we always uh, wrap our cables in extra wire and copper to make sure that we can avoid the elements there. All right, subsea cables are large, log-sized bundles of fiber optics and casing. True? OK, false. OK, it's like more or less half-half. Uh, the answer is actually false. I thought that subsea cables were these large cables that got dropped into the ocean and they sunk down, right? But they're actually only the size of a garden hose. They're very small, and they can fit anywhere between 6 and 16 fiber pairs. Um, and they're laid carefully at the bottom of the ocean. So pretty small. It's, it's cool stuff. Uh, oh, and one other fun fact. Fiber optics are actually the width of a human hair. So it's very small. Not my hair, because it's really thin, but maybe like someone with a little bit thicker hair. All right, the internet's subsea backbone is built to last for decades. True? False? Oh, another half-half. True. So the subsea cable system is built to last for over 20 years. And um, in our case, even 25 years. And that's the point at which they consider a cable economically viable from a capacity standpoint. So lots of planning coming into place here. So to describe how cables operate, fiber interconnects machines at a data center. Data centers are then connected across metropolitan regions. And to connect far-flung regions, sometimes we even uh, have cables going across mountain ranges. And to connect continents, subsea cables are then laid very carefully across the ocean floor. So all of this works as a very large system, clearly, right? Um, and one interesting uh, metric is that Gartner actually predicted the world's cloud spending to increase to $917 billion by 2025. So it's really 
pushing our needs to continue to increase the breadth of our network, right? Especially with Google Cloud customers. There are a few key reasons why we need to do this. Number one being that we need to make sure that we are able to have the capacity needed when a customer bursts thousands of VMs online in seconds. Uh, we also are continuously adding new cloud regions. We just announced six more regions, I believe, uh, last week in Austria, Greece, South of Africa. So every time we add a new cloud region, we need to make sure that there are concurrent pathways to each of these data centers and, and edge points of presence. We need to ensure that there is fast failover and no single point of failure. And when we forecast network demand, well, first off, it takes five years to even build a subsea cable, and they last for 20 to 25 years. So we can't just do a typical trend analysis to plan out our, our next cable pathways. We have to predict out five years, three years, and three to six months out using something called a sensitivity analysis, which helps us find this optimal point on the cost curve where we're balancing things like cost and capacity. Um, and so we also need to take into consideration things like latency to cloud regions as well. So to understand how we plan for capacity, there are three layers of our network that we think about. The first being the metropolitan level. So this is the network that connects data centers within a metropolitan area. And then we have our regional network, which connects or uh, are our pathways between regions. And sometimes they might be in the same continent. Sometimes they're across continents. And then lastly, our edge network. So this is the network that connects Google Cloud's network to the public internet, or ISPs, internet service providers. So we've since been able to really expand our network, especially in the last decade, to make sure that our developers can uh, you know, have this global scale and deploy seamlessly. So now we're operating in 35 regions. This is made up of 106 zones. And uh, we also have 173 network edge locations, or points of presence, POPs. And we are connecting continents via 22 high-capacity subsea cables across 200-plus countries. Uh, another fun fact is that we've been 100% carbon neutral since 2007 uh, for our network. So resilience really starts from the hardware level, and then you can continue to build on top of that with the software stack. Um, seeing that subsea cables are not immune to damage, I mentioned earlier that two-thirds of subsea cable faults are uh, by the cause of uh, fishing vessels dragging anchors. So you know, in order to make sure that we're able to continue to operate the network in the face of disruptions, we need to make sure we are creating redundant paths at the metro, the regional, and the edge layers. And the things that we want to keep in mind as a goal are to make sure that we are fault tolerant, as I mentioned. We have fast, failure, fast failover, and um, we can burst um, any kind of traffic that needs to occur at a quick point in time. So to re repair any cables, it takes weeks to repair a cable. So we, in the face of these dis disruptions, how can we make sure that we're building for redundancy? So any cross-section, meaning any point A to point B in our network, is going to have a, a redundant pathway or a concurrent network path. Um, that means multiple cables, no single points of failure, failover. And then at the data center level, we also make sure that we have more than one fiber link into and out of a data center so that we can connect our network to what we call our long haul network or our wide area network. So you can really think of our network like a central nervous system. It's, a, it's almost like in your body you have a nervous system that sends electrical signals to your nerves throughout your body. If you have something that uh, becomes non-responsive, your body has other pathways that it can hopefully send signals to your hands and your feet and whatnot. So in a similar fashion, we try to think of this as this self-healing system for our network. Uh, and our philosophy is to create redundant paths at every la layer of the stack to support traffic redistribution, to also reduce any congestion at any point in the network. And so in this example, the pathway from US West to US East might become disrupted, and so the traffic will be seamlessly redirected to US East if needed. Now, moving into the software stack that sits on top of the physical network, 
this is the beauty of vertical integration that Google, I think, has a really uh, great advantage for. Uh, so let's not forget about the software stack, and we'll dive into that. So what makes this all possible to redirect traffic seamlessly is a data center network fabric that we have developed over the past several decades called Jupyter. It's a closed hierarchical switching fabric that connects thousands of machines. And this is operating at one petabit per second by sectional bandwidth. Again, to give you a comparison, that is like transferring the entirety of Wikipedia in under one second. So it is massive, and it can handle a lot of traffic. And the reason why it has such high bandwidth is because it's non-blocking. So that means that it can burst with extremely low latency. It is what supports our fault tolerance. It is what enables um, traffic to be routed to any free output port without interfering other traffic. And so that's what enables these capabilities. And one thing that I do want to mention also is, um, you know, when we think about the network, it's any single cable or any pathway between switches is really just one part of an overall network. So you kind of think of this like a living, breathing system. So where does Google Cloud fit into all of this? So Google Cloud is actually underpinned by a virtualized software-defined network called Andromeda. This is what gives you your own personal slice of Jupyter. And it is a, a virtualized network, so kind of like how you would compare a virtual machine. That's the virtual machine that sits on top of a physical host in the same fashion. Andromeda is a virtualized network that sits on top of our physical network. And it involves a data plane, a control plane, and a manage management plane that operates for packet forwarding. And so some of the details here is that it has a dedicated core. It supports 3 million packets per second. Um, there's a cloud cluster manager, which helps you configure storage, networking, and compute. There's also a fabric management layer that's a high-level API that can uh, configure the virtual net network. And then we have the OFE, or the open flow layer. Uh, it's a programmable switch and core data plane for uh, the programming, the switching layer. And then finally, the switching layer, which is the magic of where Andromeda happens. Um, that's where it can program the software switch, and it also has a data plane here for packet processing. So that was all a mouthful, but the key thing here is that it's what allows you to deploy a global virtual private cloud. So compared to other cloud providers, something that's really uh, advan an advantage here is that you can deploy your resources on Google Cloud across regions while maintaining a single virtual private cloud. And so Andromeda is what enables this. Uh, it gives you functional and performance isolation. And it's also uh, with its on-host virtual switch and as well as the global uh, control plane, this is what enables you to be able to burst thousands of virtual machines online in a matter of minutes. You can also deploy firewall rules to these virtual machines without choke points. Um, it really does um, give you a lot of scalability, and it's kind of the magic behind some of our other Google Cloud products that you might have used. Like, if you are auto-scaling GKE clusters uh, horizontally across different zones, for example, the network is what's behind this. If you're running consistent databases using Spanner in different regions, it's still ACID compliant, and you can also have consistency between them, and that's possible through our network. And then the last example is, if you're running petabytes of data, uh, through queries on BigQuery, um, it's able to distribute that across many machines um, through our network. So what you're getting is microservices that are talking to each other over Andromeda. You're able to essentially scale compute and storage separate from one another and do a lot of these things like live migrations where you're able to perform updates on virtual machines without needing to reconfigure the VM or tear it down and spin it back up again so you can maintain state. So to understand how big this technology is, let's start by getting really, really, really microscopically small and follow the life of a photon through Google's network. So let's just say that you are deploying a web service on Google Cloud. Let's say it's a cat fashion trend website, so it has cat apparel. And you have deployed VMs, uh, backend services in different regions. And you are testing your application now with your user in Singapore, Shen. 
So the first thing that happens is Shen is going to send a request to your backend services. It's going to hit the ISP closest to Shen. It's going to recognize that the IP exists from a Google server. And first, it's going to hit a Google front end server, which exists at the many uh, hundreds of pops that exist at our network edge. So in the best case scenario, we have deployed a L7 global load balancer, which helps distribute and manage traffic across our different regional backend instances. So in this case, Shen would send the request. It's going to hit the GFE server, hit the glo global load balancer, and then the s instances in Singapore would then serve the request back to Shen. And that would be great, because Shen's already in Singapore. So the latency would be pretty, pretty good. But let's say in a worst case scenario, we either didn't deploy the regional instance yet, or something was disrupted in the network or the service. So because we've deployed the L7 global load balancer, it will actually seamlessly redirect traffic over to the next closest backend. In our case, let's say the next closest backend we've deployed is in the US West region. This happens without the developer needing to lift a finger. If you have enabled the L7 load balancer, it happens seamlessly, dynamically, automatically, and it's a great tool to use. So I do want to touch on this just a bit, because I think this is something that um, is definitely worth trying out if you are deploying instances in the cloud. The L7 load balancer, as I said, it handles L7 HTTP or HTTPS traffic to your backends. It is powerful because it's done in software rather than hardware. And so it avoids a lot of the pitfalls that you get with traditional DNS load balancing. Um, and so just to provide an example, if we were using a DNS load balancer, you would have different public IP addresses that would route to these various backends in different places. Now, typically what you would have to do is manually update those DNS entries if something were to go down. And that means that it can cause a delay in state convergence because those DNS entries would have to be propagated to your ISP, and it might take some time for um, you know, people to be redirected to the correct backend. Things are a little bit out of your control at that point, and you would have more latency. With the Google HTTPS L7 load balancer, again, as I said, it gives you uh, a software-based load balancer, and you get a single Anycast IP. So all of your users, whether they're located in California, New York, Singapore, are going to be hitting the same public IP address. And instead, Google Cloud is uh, advertising a global set of IP blocks that represent your backend instances. So this is really going to help you deploy resilient applications because you have much less choke points existing. So what's happening um, at here is that it's performing a weighted selection here. So let's say the backend in Singapore is down. Their traffic is going to get redirected to US West or US East, depending on a few different factors. Things like proximity to the user, things like the amount of incoming load, um, the health of the back end, and the capacity of the back end. So it's doing a weighted selection. It's called the waterfall by region algorithm. And this can actually handle millions of queries per second. So you can be sure that you can deploy your instances as close to the end user as possible. And even if you're not able to, you'll maintain um, as low latency as physically possible. So, on the data model side, bear with me on what happens next. So from the request that's being sent in from Singapore, it's going to hit a global forwarding rule, which will hand off the request to a target proxy. There, it terminates the client session. And you can set up things like a URL map. You can have host and path rules to direct traffic to specific backends. The backend service is what checks whether the backend is healthy in that region and take into consideration some of those factors I mentioned and then um, direct it to the specific instance or, or a group of instances uh, called a managed instance group in that region. And the great thing about this is that you can um, choose backends to route specific traffic to based on things like cost, um, based on capacity, based on sustainability, which has become more important recently. So those are good things to, to keep in mind. Um, what's nice about the L7 load balancer and this waterfall by region algorithm as well is that it works in conjunction with auto-scaling instance groups. So if you have a sudden burst in traffic, it can help auto-scale uh, your instance groups in regions. And if it reaches a threshold that you determine, it will pass over traffic to the next closest region, and so on and so forth. So again, it can scale to handle millions of requests per second, um, and then it's kind of up to you to select uh, specific 
thresholds that you want to maintain. So just to kind of continue with the story here, what's happening here is that the request is going to be proxied through the GFE servers. It forwards the query to the back end with our cat web server. And then the, GFE, the back end service will send the request back. And the GFE server will cache the response if you have CDN enabled or content delivery network enabled. And that's what happens to the life of the photon. So going back to the physical layer for just a second, because I still want to connect the, do the dots here. Um, what happens at the physical layer for the network is photons are sent from Singapore. It might go over terrestrial cable networks and subsea cable networks to then eventually make it over to the US West region. And what's happening here is photons are being essentially moved out of our data center through transmission equipment. And they're going to be shooting out through one of the fiber links out of our data center. And these fibers are bundled in an outside cable plant. And they're going to be sent over these cable networks over to the US West region. But one thing that might happen is something where the, since these are basically lasers shooting light through fiber, uh, inevitably something that happens is the light diminishes over long distances. And this is something that's called attenuation. So in one of our white papers, we did study the effect of attenuation since they are traveling thousands of kilometers over our network. And you can see here that after 3,200 kilometers, they do diminish quite a bit. So what we do in this case is we place optical amplifiers at hundreds of points over our network. They are in our terrestrial cable network, and they're also in our subsea cable network. And this basically helps boost the signal back up to make it to the destination. Um, Typically, photons are traveling at about 2 thirds the speed of light. And so every moment, we're having about 800,000 uh, YouTube videos every second, or about 8,000, uh, sorry, eight, is it 8,000? 8,000 YouTube videos and 200,000 photos traveling over our network at any moment. So the journey of the photon finally ends in Singapore. It traveled over the land, it traveled undersea, and it was amplified along the way along all of these optical amplifiers to get, make it back to Shen. And it did this all in milliseconds, which is very impressive. Um, and so this is just the beginning. We're, we're again continuing to add more regions and pathways all over the world to support uh, additional um, global presence. And so one of the ways that you can most easily take advantage of this scale and resilience is to use something that we call our premium tier network. And so this is on by default. It basically means that you're able to use our private network backbone. But to really understand why this is special, you kind of have to understand how the public internet works. So the public internet works. You have different ISPs that exist all over the world. And they all interconnect through various access points uh, all over the world. And the typical agreement between ISPs is something called hot potato routing. So I don't know if this is, exists in France, but there's this game that you can play as a kid where you have something in your hand, and you're supposed to pretend it's a hot potato. So you pass it off as quickly as you can to the next person because it's supposed to be you know, scalding hot. So in the same vein here, ISPs typically want to hand off traffic to the next ISP as quickly as possible to lower the cost and the burden and the maintenance on them. right? So this can lead to more hops in the network and additional routes. So to kind of give you an example, if you're in Europe and you're, you have a user in Chile sending traffic over there, their ISP probably has an agreement with a fiber supplier and uh, another ISP. So it's going to increase in the number of hops and additional latency. So the premium tier network, by the way, the last network is offered on Google Cloud at a lower cost, and it's called standard tier. But the premium tier network is by default, and it uses something called cold potato routing. So what we do is we hold on to the traffic as long as possible before the last mile, essentially, to the, to the end user. And so the benefit of this is that we're able to maintain the traffic on our private network. Uh, and then you can kind of think of it like you know, an e-commerce company uh, handling, I'm not going to say which big e-commerce, like, OK, Amazon, for example, handling distribution all over the world. And they pass off the last mile to you know, local distributors, right? 
That way they're able to leverage the scale, and in the same way, Google is also able to leverage that scale. Don't tell my boss I use that comparison here. <laughs> but um, in the same way, yeah, cold potato routing um, helps us maintain the, the bandwidth and lower latency. And if Google Cloud or Google was an ISP, it would actually be the largest ISP in the world. So that's how much we operate. So how can you deploy resilient applications of your own on Google Cloud and leverage some of these capabilities? So I just uh, attended Next, and I, I hosted a session there about some of our latest launches in networking, so I'm just going to cover a few of them. Um, they all fall into four core principles here, so migrating workloads, modernizing them, securing them, and then having observability. So a lot of our products are, we're aiming to meet developers where they are, make it easier for them. We have some AI and ML built into our products. And of course, security has become front and center even more recently, so we're trying to build in security as much as possible into our products. So the first step that I think that you can all take is, is kind of take in, into consideration what workloads you might be either deploying in the cloud or migrating into the cloud, and how you can connect them to other private services that exist in other environments. That might be on-premise, that might be in other cloud providers, and how you can maintain private consumable services easily. So one of my favorite launches that came out recently is something called Private Service Connect. With the advent of more applications and microservices, you have things like ERP applications. You have things like log analytics, financial data sets, and they might exist all over the place. More diverse services typically means more complexity. And developers you know, don't really want to set up all the IP tables, the routes. I mean, does anybody like setting up routing tables or doing NAT rules? No, right? It's, it's typically not something we want to handle unless you're a network administrator or a network engineer. So the goal of PSC is to allow you, as a developer, to essentially connect services very easily and have them be over an encrypted connection and use private IP addresses to main, maintain security here. Um, initially, what we had was L4 layer um, networking for PSC, but we just launched layer 7 PSC. So that allows you to do more things like control security policies, do telemetry, and connect services more easily between environments. We also rolled out the support for hybrid PSC. Um, so that means you can connect things like things on premise to the cloud very easily. Um, all you do is set up endpoints between a consumer service and a producer service. And you can even set up the L7 load balancer that I just talked about to have a public endpoint for your services, but that still gets passed off to private backend services. One other thing to mention is um, you can also maintain data residency using PSC. So espe especially for EU customers who need to maintain traffic within one region for um, you know, GDPR reasons, PSC supports the ability for you to send traffic to a Google API and, and uh, have that be encrypted over from a workload that exists in that same region. Uh, and PSC will make sure that the data in transit will uh, remain in that region. So we also added new partner managed services here. So Confluent, Databricks, Datastax, Grafana, and Neo4j. So some of their products, you might want to connect easily to them. And now this is uh, integrated into PSC. So the second category here is modernizing. Uh, cloud CDN is something that I kind of touched on earlier. And it's not, an, it's not a new launch. But I think it's worth mentioning. This is something that you can use really easily on top of the L7 load balancer. Um, it allows you to cache static or web content closest to your end users. And it basically caches that content at our GFEs or the points of presence all over the world. And in turn, that allows you to decrease the burden on your backend services uh, and then kind of lower the latency there. So it's something that you can enable very easily on Google Cloud through pretty much the click of a button if you're using the L7 load balancer. But you do also have the option of using your own load balancer in conjunction with the CDN as well. So when I mentioned that you know, this is a system that can handle millions of queries per second, if you use it with cache content, again, you're able to increase that resilience and availability of your services everywhere. We also came out with a new product recently called Media CDN. This is a little bit different than Cloud CDN. It's really great for high egress throughput traffic. So for example, live streaming, video content. It's good for broadcast companies. 
And it differs because it actually uses the infrastructure that YouTube uses. Uh, don't ask me why that's different, but YouTube <laughs> you know, has their CDN. It's powerful, clearly. Um, but yeah, so Media CDN enables you to uh, deploy custom code uh, across th these 1,300 cities around the world. Um, and recently, we have enabled a few developer-friendly tools like live, the Livestream API, which lets you ingest and uh, deploy source content into custom HTTP live streaming or Dash formats. Um, we also have enabled the Google Ad Manager dynamic ad insertion, which lets you do custom uh, advertisement placement in your streaming services uh, or personalized ad content using the Video Stitcher API. So if that's relevant for you, it's, it's a powerful option. So next, security, because preventing web threats is super important in today's climate. One of the most impressive products um, that I think deserves more attention is Cloud Armor. Um, it's something that works in conjunction with the HTTPS load balancer and CDN now as well. But it basically helps you prevent and mitigate L7 DDoS attacks. So it has a lot of built-in ML capabilities that help determine when you might be experiencing an, atta an attack. And now we've also launched the capability for you to do non-HTTP use cases. So if you have a TCP load balancer deployed or an SSL proxy load balancer deployed, it can help protect your services from L7 DDoS attacks or fraud bots that are shooting you know, tons of requests at your application. One of the coolest things is that it recently was able to detect one of well, the biggest DDoS attack that's recorded to date. So just a month or so ago, it actually detected and mitigated a DDoS attack that peaked at 46 million requests per second. And that's 76% higher than the previously recorded record. So it's, it was a massive attack. And basically recognized it using something we call adaptive protection, which has the ML capabilities in it. And it notified the team right away. They were able to use this new feature that we GA'd called rate limiting. So they basically were able to throttle the, the requests coming into it. So definitely a great option if you're already using the L7 load balancer and CDN. And then the last section is observability. Because you know, developers typically don't want to like go through trace routes and figure out what's wrong. And a lot of the first thing that you look towards when you face an issue with service going down is the network. You want to find out questions like, are my firewall rules the culprit? Uh, what's the performance from VM1 to VM2? Or um, things like, where are my unused IP addresses? So you basically want to optimize your network. And I think now cloud is reaching this point of maturity where we've built in a lot of these capabilities so that it takes off that burden off your plate. So one of the modules that exists is called network, uh, it's called network topology. And it basically allows you to visualize your network in a map. So you can see network throughput. You can see latency or round trip time. You can also see high egress instances and how they relate to other uh, resources in your cloud. We also have something called connectivity test, which lets you uh, send a probe through your network and find out whether you misconfigured a firewall rule or route, and you aren't able to connect to a specific service. And then performance dashboard allows you to see performance metrics like packet loss, uh, latency between your resources in Google Cloud, and also among all Google Cloud resources, like just publicly everything that's running on Google Cloud. So you can really fine tune and uh, make sure you're targeting any uh, latency issues. And Firewall Insights lets you configure and optimize your firewall rules. So you can find out things like, is fi a firewall rule shadowing another one? Or do you have any unused firewall rules? And then you can clean up your environment that way pretty easily. So the new thing here is something that we GA at least recently is called Network Analyzer. It lets you check out and see any misconfigurations for any products on Google Cloud. So you can see things like misconfigured routes, firewall firewall rules, a lot of the things I just talked about in one page for your GKE clusters, for your Cloud SQL instances, uh, for VMs. And it's really great because you're able to move from reactive to proactive and finding out root cause, and it's all surfaced for you automatically. A couple of other new things is performance dashboard now shows you your Google Cloud to internet traffic performance as well. 
And then you also have top talkers in network topology, meaning that you can quickly see which instances are the highest egress instances, so you can make sure you're not spending a ton of money and you can optimize for performance that way. So that was a lot, and it was a mouthful, but I kind of just want to summarize the takeaways here. So if you want to build on top of this resilient infrastructure and the subsea cables, there are a few things that you can easily do, which is uh, prevent and mitigate attacks uh, using Cloud Armor, which front ends your L7 load balancer to help distribute traffic to your backends, and you can use Cloud CDN with a click of a button there too. So these are, I think, easy ways that you can deploy services on Google Cloud and make sure that you are making, uh, maintaining well-protected services all over the world with lower latency to your end users. So that's all I have for today. I want to say whether you're deploying e-commerce applications for cat fashion or you're using Cloud Spanner instances or BigQuery and running petabytes of data, um, the network is really what underpins all of these capabilities at the end of the day. It's kind of like plumbing. That's the way I see networking. You never really notice the network unless it doesn't work or it stops working. And the reason why we never notice search or YouTube go down is because of the network among the software stack that sits on top. So I don't think I'm ever going to be uh, stop being fascinated by this physical network, even though I work in cloud and I work in these software abstracted fields. Uh, so I do hope that you kind of learned a little something new here and you're able to take away some of these services to think about how you can also build and deploy your own resilient applications and hope you can try out some of these products on Google Cloud. So thank you so much and have a great lunch. <laughs> yeah. I'll stick around for a couple questions. Has any of you got questions after see this great conference? Yes. Hi there. Thanks for the talk. Very interesting. Uh, super quick question. Uh, what, if any of this, is open source so that I can go read the code and learn how it works? Ooh, that's a great question. Um, some of it might be. So I think there are things that we're working on for Cloud Armor, for example, that are based on open source um, things. So we are part of consortiums and foundations that do things like, uh, for example, attestations for your software delivery. Um, it might not be specifically Cloud Armor, but I think that there are a lot of things that work in conjunction with Cloud Armor that are open source. Um, we have uh, software level artifacts that are just coming out too that we're working on to help protect your software delivery. That's a whole nother topic. Um, but yeah, with the L7 load balancer, that's something that is a little bit proprietary, I would say, to Google Cloud because that's something we've built um, in software on our existing infrastructure and it's kind of hard to replicate that on your own infrastructure without kind of that scale, so. But there are also open source papers that repositories claim that they have such. Oh yeah, absolutely, so that's a great point. So I showed you a white paper that showed, you know, how we send traffic over long distances, but in the same vein, we also have white papers that show Jupiter, for example. We've explained exactly how we've deployed it over time, things like Andromeda. We've started to e actually release more information because of the cloud, right? Um, so if you are interested in learning about how we built that from the ground up over time, look up Jupiter, Andromeda, uh, and we have like things about our storage system, Colossus, and how we're able to distribute storage across our data centers too. So a great way for just understanding our system. Any other question from the audience? Well, then I will have the, the last one. So as a software developer, is there any special or good practice that we can use or apply so we can take advantage of this specific infrastructure that you just described to us? So general tips for developers here. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of developers often ask the question, how do I scale over time? Is this something that I need to start with right away? And I don't think that's necessarily true. You can start with a small use case on Google Cloud. It really depends on what you're doing. It might be a small project, but just try to, remember these concepts, right? Like, what's the next step in the iteration of your software? Are you planning on, you know, scaling the application in the future? Make sure that you can front end with a load balancer, and then things like Cloud Armor and CDN, you can add on after the fact. You can add that on later on. So I don't think that's something that you need to feel pressure to take on right away, but it's, it's good to think about the overall architecture uh, from the beginning. Well, thank you very much, Stephanie. Thank you.